we'll be um, hearing from three published authors who have published books in the area of spirituality and spiritual direction. And um, they're going to talk for about 10, 15 minutes about, about their work, about publishing process, you know, some of the challenges. Um, I'm going to also invite Stephen Cranzell, who is the, what's your title, Stephen? Content? I am Director of Content and Communities for SDI, and welcome to all of you. Look forward to talking with you. So Stephen's going to give us a rundown. Um, there are some publishing opportunities within the Spiritual Directors International, so we'll run that through that. Then we've got a chance to ask any questions. So this is just an informal um, uh, opportunity to ask questions. If you've got um, material that you're interested in getting published or you've got questions about the publishing process. We'll take a break for 10, 15 minutes, probably at the next hour. Um, so in about an hour's time. And then after the break, we have two round table uh, papers being presented, one by Anna Killigrew, who is from, based out of Dove West Australia on desert spirituality, and Noel Kabating <coughs> about family systems and um, family systems and supervision of spiritual directors. So it's a rich morning of um, all sorts of different areas. Uh, some things will may appeal to you, some things you know, um, not relevant right at the moment, but I um, assure you that it's all going to be interesting. So I'd like to begin with Irene. So Irene, if you would, uh, I'm going to go and put you on spotlight. And if you would like to share your, um, share your screens. So Irene is a Brisbane based author and she is talking about a book that she published called Practicing the Presence of Jesus, Contemporary Meditation. So I'm going to hand it to you, Irene, and um, if you'd like to, to share your experience and your, and your work, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. So I'm, I've written uh, a number of books that are relevant to spiritual direction. So I'm just going to talk about a few of them to get a, give a bit of an overview. But this one that, um, that I think is probably most relevant is, um, is Practicing the Presence of Jesus, uh, which, which it's actually from Ignatian Composition of Place. And I come from an evangelical background. And so I, I, uh, have read the Bible all my life, but was not aware of a lot of the contemplative practices. And so I've really, I've written this in, um, in the hope that it's helpful for spiritual directors and directees in particular to give directees so that they can uh, learn more about um, composition of place. So the, the contents there are just, you can see it's just a whole lot of different ways of using composition of place. And, it's very much, it's uh, each of those chapters tells you something. I use my, myself as an example, so it's actually fairly um, personal, but in the hope that it encourages people to, to start using this way of engaging with the scripture and, uh, and finding particularly the stories of Jesus to engage with, with Jesus. So... Um, that, that would be the one that's most relevant, but there are others, there are a few other books I just want to mention as well while I'm about it. And then later on when we come to publishing, I'll talk about that. So I don't intend to talk about that at present. So this is just, uh, it's another little book that I wrote because of playing around with that composition of place and using active imagination. I, um, I chose a whole lot of stories from the, uh, from the Gospels and imagined what would it be like to go and talk to those people and get them to tell me about their life and what it was like for them to, to meet with Jesus and, uh, and what, what happened since. So it's, it's, it's using my imagination but engaging hopefully again to inspire other people in uh, how, they can, how they can do that. Oops. Uh, then this one, this one is about images of God, exploring images of God, which is an important part of um, spiritual direction. And again, recognizing from my own journey growing up uh, in the evangelical church that, that God was always male. And uh, I eventually realized in my 30s and even into my 40s what that did to me as a woman, that, that I 
I found my femininity, my feminineness belittled as a result of that. And, uh, and so I started exploring the feminine that is present in the scriptures and in lots of church mystics and so on, church fathers. Uh, but particularly what I did in this one was look at some journeys of men who have engaged with the feminine because there's lots of stuff out there about the feminine, but mostly written by women um, and, and, and their experience. So, so recognizing that there are people like Thomas Merton and um, Jung and uh, William Young and, um, and others who have, uh, Paul Young, who have engaged with the feminine and what that's been, been like for them. So that's a bit of a resource for, for that. And then uh, Dancing with God is one, one of the first books I wrote and it's talking about true self and false self. So it's more of a teaching, but again, engages with the stories. And, uh, and then finally this one, uh, it's, a, it's a, a reader and it, I was just part of the editing process. It's actually, it's again a resource, it's a, uh, a whole year of daily readings um, quote with quotes from pre-reformation mystics martyrs monks um, and i i long for people to discover the the incredible rich christian heritage that we have and that again uh, as protestants we tend to jump over the 2000 years as if the as if the early church was the only resource that we should use and there's these wonderful treasures. So this is a book of, I think it's a, a real treasure trove that uh, Charles Ringmer has put together and I was part of the editing process of it. So again, it's a resource for, um, for delving into some of these, these mystics. So uh, I'll just go back, see if I can go back. Uh, the best way to, to get any of those books is to just, is to email me, especially if you live in Australia. You, that's the cheapest way to do it. But uh, of course, um, if you use Amazon or Fishpond or Book Depository, that's the other the other place to get them. Or the publisher of several of them is Whitfin Stock in uh, in Oregon, so they also would have them. So thank you. That's me. Hi. Thank you. So tell us a little bit, Irene, about um, and I've just put to email address in the chat so you can easily copy and paste it. Tell us about the, the publishing process, Irene. How did you go about, you obviously had some ideas and then how did you um, find a publisher? Yeah. Or Look, I, uh, the first book that I was part of publishing, uh, my colleague and I did through amazon.com as a, as a um, uh, self-published uh, book because it was very specific about narrative therapy and Christian faith and uh, we couldn't find a publisher, so so we did it through. You can self-publish. It's actually a very cheap way to do it. They, they paid well in those days seventy dollars for them to courier the book back, so that you say yes, I'm happy with that, and then it just goes on Amazon, and they set a price that they will take, and you can set the price whatever you want to, so that you make a profit or not, as the case may be. Um, but after that, I actually because I had a friend who had published quite a lot of books, I was able to uh, get onto that agent, who then published, got a, a, um, two or three books published for me through through different publishers, but then it became harder and harder and harder. And uh, and so because I've now got some with Whitfinstock or Cascade, they're sometimes called in Oregon, because they now know me, then I'm able to publish with them. But they are, they're a small company and they can't do much marketing. So it's, it's not a good way to get marketing done. In fact, mm -hmm extremely hard to get marketing done these days. Mm -hmm. So how do you do your marketing? How do you promote your books? I'm terrible. Yeah, you shouldn't ask me that question. <laughs> I'm sure there not are people who are not I'm not a I'm not a marketer networker. I just I try and let people know when like things like this or when I'm speaking or, or whatever. But um, yeah. yeah, other people will answer that better than I have. And what about the process of editing a book and, you know, choosing covers and that sort of stuff? What have you, how have you done yeah, that? Yeah, so, so the, uh, the cover and the title is the right of the publisher. So I've had one book published that I hated both. Uh, and I'm very happy. I've just had a second edition done and I was able to choose my own cover and my own title very gratefully. Um, but it's up, up to them because after all, they're the ones selling it. As far as the editing, I happen to be a pretty good editor myself, but 
publishers will often have a way that, that they they edit and you have to pay for that. Um, so different publishers do that do that differently. But these days, as a friend of mine says, publishing is, is just writing is a very expensive hobby. Mm. You, unless, as David said recently, you're going to publish ten thousand books, you're probably not going to either publish it or make money out of it. Mm -hmm. So I don't make money out of it. Right, you just do it for the for the love of getting the message out, and <laughs> yeah. And what sort of word limit um, are most of your books? Do you? Um, most of them are only around fifty, sixty thousand. Quite sure that seems again to be the the current popular way to do it. Um, mm -hmm. A couple of them, and and that reader, of course, is quite thick. But a couple of them are more like um, 100, 120 words, maybe. Uh, because of that, the Divine Feminine one, for example, was was that more like that length. But um, but generally, uh, unless it's a textbook kind of book, then shorter is better. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Are you working on something the next a next book? Actually, a group of us. So there's a group of us called the Holy Scribblers, <laughs> um, <laughs> and we've just written a book in response to COVID. Uh, faith responses. To COVID, so that's just with our our editing person right now, and uh, Cascade have agreed to publish that. So we hope it'll be quite soon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wonderful. And if anyone's got any questions for Irene, pop them in the chat. Um, we'll I'll go to uh, David next, and he can talk, and then at the end uh, we'll we'll have a longer discussion. So thank you so much, Irene. It was really good to get your insights. Thank you. So. David Tacey. Uh, David Tacey has written several books, many books. What are you up to, David? I've lost count. I don't know. <laughs> 20 plus. Um, no, David, no. It, it's about 16, I think. Um, I'm working on another one at the moment on... Um, oh, I haven't had a shave today. <laughs> Embarrassing. You know, in lockdown here in Melbourne, we're in hard lockdown. It's hard to, it's hard to do the daily rituals like shaving and all those sorts of things. <laughs> um, so um, I'm I'm working on another book on Australian spirituality, mm -hmm. and everyone says, "Is there any?" Um, and um, uh, that's the that's the uh, uh, the response I often get, but um, people thought that it was going to be on Aboriginal spirituality. Of course, that's a big part of Australian spirituality. And my publisher, um, who's a little Catholic publisher, um, they published this book of mine most recently. Um, called Just hold it still. Yeah, Beyond Literal Belief. Beyond Literal Belief. Uh, What's the subtitle? I can't read Religion as Metaphor. <laughs> yeah, Religion as Metaphor, yeah. And um, that was published by, um, what's their name? Um, Garrett. Garrett oh. Publishing in Melbourne. And they're quite good. Uh, and they do a good job of the, the print, nice big print. What I don't like these days is print that you can't, you can't even read because the type, typing is so, um, is so small, the, um, the font is so small. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, I've got, um, I'm working with a um, Aboriginal writer because the publisher thought that was advisable. And her name is Victoria Grieve Williams. And um, if you Google her, uh, there's quite a lot of stuff um, on Aboriginal spirituality, which is available for free download on the internet. Strangely enough, she lives in New York. Um, and so, um, you know, we have a bit of difficulty with the time zone. Um, that's more so, more so than even Stephen, who lives in Seattle. Um, New York is even further away. Um, Another book which I'd like to mention is The Spirituality Revolution. And again, I can't read the subtitle. What does it say, Kristen? The, um, the Emergence of Contemporary Spirituality. Yeah, yeah. It, to me, it comes up back to the front. But um, mm -hmm. 
So this came out and it was written partly as a, an attempt to understand the nature of contemporary spirituality. Um, there wasn't much written when I wrote that. And strangely, a year later, a book came out in the UK by Paul Helas and Linda Woodhead with exactly the same title. Oh, really? Uh, and that, that was a bit of a shock. But it was good in a way because it just showed you that a lot of people are thinking about this. They are sociologists and so they give a sociological account. And uh, I'm not, I'm a, I'm what's called a cultural psychologist. So I don't provide the sociological data and things like that. Mm -hmm. This is my most recent book, which I'll try to hold. The Post Secular Sacred. Jung, Soul and Meaning. <laughs> what is it? Jung, Soul and Meaning in an Age of Change. Yeah. I'm, I don't, I'm not very good at remembering things like that. Jung, Soul and Meaning in a, in a Time of Change or something like that. And I, um, Age of Change. And it's, um, it's got a nice cover. It does. That's an actual uh, a photograph of a, of a DNA spiral or a DNA something or other. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know much about science, but there is a chapter in there on contemporary physics and how it relates to spirituality. So that was through Rutledge, was it, David? Oh, yeah. This one here, this was Rutledge. I couldn't get this published in Australia. As you know, Kristen, we're not a very spiritual country. Um, if it was on football or soccer or tennis, I'm sure I'd get it published. But because it's on spirituality, it's very hard to get publishers here. So it came out in London and New York um, earlier this year, actually. And it's a horrendous price. I wouldn't buy it myself, so I wouldn't recommend it to anybody. Um, it's um, the problem with publishing with London and New York is that the price by the time uh, the currency conversion, it, it gets, it's impossible to purchase. Um, and um, they stuck the word Jung in the subtitle. I don't know why, because um, it's not about Jung at all. But some of you might know that my uh, reputation and profile is largely about my understanding of Jung's psychology. And I try to get away from that because Jung is good, but there's more to life than Jung. And I think I'm sort of over Jung. Although I'm keen to read Irene's book on the divine feminine, which has a chapter on Jung, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, but so talk about marketing. So it, the book is not about Jung, but because I'm well known as a Jungian writer, they stuck that in against my wishes so that it would get better international coverage. And, um, and so that's what marketing does. It sometimes does things that are pretty awful. Now, as for editing, I'm quite unlike Irene. I love being edited. It's like, um, hi there. Yeah. It's, um, it's like being massaged. I love being massaged, especially my back. And I love people massaging my words. And um, I, one of my faults as a writer is that I repeat myself. And I know that, but I can't overcome it somehow. I, I think there are all these points that I've got to make over and over again. And then I'll make them again in the next chapter and again in the conclusion. So the editor, Kristen, is very important for me, um, <clears throat> reining in my repetitions. And uh, publishers don't like repetition. And uh, if you get a good editor, as I say, it's like having a good massage. Um, it takes away all the tension and the, you know, the, the writing is able to be uh, more um, accessible to the reader. So I love being edited and I've always been edited by, by good people. 
mostly they're always women. There must be a lot of women in editing, I think. And they've got a good feel for uh, writing. And sometimes these editors are themselves writers. Um, <clears throat> so that's about it. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to ask me, Kristen? Um, so talk about your marketing. Is it something that you've done much of or you let the publishers do that for you? Only if the publishers would do the marketing. Um, I find that um, <laughs> uh, books, you know, these books, it says on the cover that it's sold in New York and London. I don't know if they do any marketing. Um, I think the only marketing is, for me, uh, the fact that I have a Wikipedia page and I'm not even sure who wrote that page. It's, it's quite odd. It's quite detailed. So somebody's been stalking me um, and uh, writing up, I did this and I was born here and grew up there and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. It seems to be from Norway. Anyway, that's pretty much my only marketing device is to have a Wikipedia page created by someone I don't even know. Um, but um, Routledge <coughs> aren't good at marketing. And when I, keep, when I ever talk to them about this, they say, our, our brand is the marketing. Oh, I think, oh, dear me, this is a bit much. Their brand is the marketing. Mm -hmm. And uh, what they mean by that, if you publish with Routledge, you have an automatic market from the world's libraries. All the world's libraries have mm -hmm. standing orders with Routledge. Um, and I don't think Routledge does any marketing at all. I've been to conferences based around my work in, in Britain Switzerland and North America and Routledge never got my books there. And uh, so I, a bit like Irene, I think marketing is uh, a very difficult thing. And uh, you just hope that people get on the internet and know your name as a writer and, and Google. Um, most shops in Australia don't carry my books because um, I was told by book bookshop owners that about 95% of books never get into bookshops because there's too many of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you can't walk into a bookshop in Australia and pick up any of my stuff because it isn't there. Um, the best part, the best marketing people I found is this, is this people. Uh, they're Harper Collins in Sydney. Mm -hmm. They're very good at marketing. Um, if you're giving a conference somewhere, they'll get in touch with their conference uh, coordinator and um, the books will be there miraculously. Mm -hmm. But that's because it's a commercial publisher. But there's, there's a double-edged sword being a commercial publisher because... Um, as Irene just said, uh, commercial publishers now want sales in the vicinity of 10,000 copies per volume. And if you don't look like a 10,000 copy prospect, they won't actually take you on at all. Mm -hmm. That wasn't the case when I started, Kristen. I started publishing books in the early 80s. So I'm very old now. And um, it was not a requirement that you have many sales of books. <clears throat> 10,000 is a lot of books. Mm. Um, and so I can't get published anymore with HarperCollins, Australia, or San Francisco, or London, because I'm ruled out as a commercially viable prospect. Mm -hmm. So... Um, if anyone's got any ideas about publishing, let me know. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, I mean, Irene spoke about self-publishing and I respect that. I think that a lot of good work these days is self-published, but as an academic, I wasn't allowed to self-publish. Mm -hmm. You know, I was a university professor. 
and self-publishing was just ruled out mm -hmm. as not tenable. So, so David, someone asked a, a question about basically it's hard and it's hard to market and you probably don't make a huge amount of money of it. Um, off oh, no. why, why do you do it? What's your motivation to, to write books? Well, when you get a, when you get an itch, you scratch it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so that's what I do. I have the, I've got this sense, I've always had it since I was about 12, the sense that we're on the brink of a massive spirituality emergence as a countercultural response to the increased materialism in society. We're, we're seeing more and more people, not necessarily religious people, but more and more people in all walks of life have a huge hunger for spirituality. And uh, I found this as a university teacher that my students had enormous hunger. So when I taught a course on spirituality, there were hundreds and hundreds of students piling in. And miraculously, none of them asked, what can I do on, with, with my qualifications once I've studied your courses, none of them were, none of them said that. Although some of their parents did, they'd come along on open day and say, David, if my children do your courses, what, what does it qualify them for? And um, <laughs> what kind of job can they get? Mm. Um, and I used to say, it mightn't give them a job, but it will give them a life. And with a life, you can be more inspired to, to find a job that suits you. Mm -hmm. And so I, I saw myself as catering to the right hemisphere of the brain, which is the one that uh, is so strong with me. It's the so-called feminine side of the brain. And that's always been strong for me. And the rest of the, the university curriculum, apart from the arts and philosophy is all to do with technical matters. And so um, I've always wanted to write. So I write not because I want to, but because I have to. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a compulsion, actually. It's, it's almost an obsession. Mm -hmm. um, it's almost an addiction. Mm -hmm. See, I don't drink alcohol and I don't smoke. I don't take drugs. I write books on spirituality. That's my addiction. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks, David. That was very well put. That gives them a life. Um, I might, um, I might ask, pose that question to Irene as well. Um, what? Why do you write? What? You know, it's 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 not going to make you rich. But I just wonder, what what's your, um, you know, what's the need in you to write books, Irene? Um, because I'm a two on the Enneagram. No, no, I shouldn't start a, question, a sentence like that, should I? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I if, if there is a gap where I, I see that something isn't written, then that's what motivates me. If I think, oh, someone's already written on this, then I won't, I won't write on it. Um, but so the, the Divine Feminine, as I said, there are, there are a lot of books about the Divine Feminine and Christian, Christian perspective now, but... What I, what I saw the gap was, was yes, but how do men engage with the divine feminine? And so that's what motivated me to, to say, oh, I can say something about this. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, wonderful. Um, I just had another question and I might start with you and um, I just wanted to, okay. We had a third author, but we haven't seen him. Um, that's fine. So Bernie asked a question about whether you found um, if going with a publisher, does it make any difference to potential for distribution and marketing? Does it help? So you've had an experience, Irene, of both self-publishing and going through a publisher. How does that help sort of distribution and marketing? Yeah, so so I actually wrote a response, I think, privately. Oh, that one. Um, because uh, I think if, I presume she's saying, how, does, how is it better than self-publishing? It's this whole question of marketing. And um, if you're good at marketing, then self-publishing would be fine. But, but most 
writers aren't also good at marketing, it would seem to me. And certainly mm. in my case, that's true. So uh, for me to have a publisher, at least to put it out there in some, some contexts, um, even if it's Amazon or the publisher's page, whatever, that's better for me because I'm not going to be the one that does it otherwise. Uh, whereas the first book I mentioned that I self we self-published through uh, Amazon, my colleague who wrote that with me was good at using um, uh, Google ads to, to get people to find out about it. And because it was a very specific topic, it worked to do it that way. So we probably sold, made more out of that book than anything else. Oh, yeah. really? Because he was able to do that, that marketing because the book topic fitted with marketing it well. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And what about you, David? Have you found a, di a difference with distribution and marketing? You haven't self-published, have you? You've just always gone through No, um, I haven't. I mean, my university forbade self-publishing. Yeah. They're very old-fashioned in that regard, you know. Um, and so I always had to publish through commercial or academic publishers. But um, I can only say that academic publishers are atrocious at marketing, but commercial publishers are terrific at marketing. Um, so there's an enormous difference between academic and commercial uh, publishing. And um, I'm a bit like Irene, I, I'm not very good at marketing myself. And maybe if I go to a conference, I might throw a box of my books into the boot of the car and sell them at ridiculously low prices so that I, I actually make a loss rather than a profit. I can't stand the fact that I look on the internet and some of my books are 80, 100 or $150. It actually hurts my soul terribly. And, um, uh, you know, but um, marketing is a, is a problem. But I'm like Irene, I'm not good at it personally. Mm -hmm. I've got yeah. a question about, and I might start with you, David, about what's the, the daily rhythm of writing? So I imagine most of your, a lot of your day is taken up with writing. How do you, how do you approach it? Well, as I said, I've done about 16 books and I wrote most of those or, or 14 of those while I was working full time. Mm -hmm. And, um, Often I, I was working so hard, there was no chance that I could write in the day. I, I got to become head of my department at the university and that was more than a full-time job. So I'd come home exhausted, rest and have dinner, watch the nightly news and usually I would start writing at about 8 or 9 o'clock and finish at about 1 or 2 a.m. in the morning. Wow. So most of my books are, are nighttime books. They're the time that I felt the world was slowing down. I was slowing down and I was able to commune with the sacred and also seek direction from the sacred. So I'm somebody who needs um, constant contact with the sense of the sacred. Otherwise, I can't write a word. Um, I need a muse, and, and that muse has always been a feminine muse, and that's why I must get Irene's book on the divine feminine. And um, now I've retired, but because of the vir virus, I, I, I feel numbed at the moment. I, I look at the numbers of people dying in the world, and I have a numbed response. Like two weeks ago, I did a, a seminar for Rio de Janeiro on Zoom for two and a half hours. And there were 192 people joined that seminar. But Brazil has one of the highest rates of COVID infection in the world. And I kind of felt numbed by the enormity of what we're going through at the moment. And I can't dissociate myself from that suffering. Um, it must be like being a writer during a world war. You know, can you imagine trying to write about the divine feminine when there's a world war on? It must be very almost impossible. So um, you write when you can. 
Um, and, you know, when I had a young daughter, I noticed I didn't write anything for three and a half years because I was, when I'd come back from work, I'd be on night duty and my uh, wife would be sleeping and resting. So you have to write when you can. And um, often I'm not, not one of those people that sits, sits down and says, right, it's nine o'clock, it's time to start writing. For me, I'd rather go for a walk at that time and uh, if it's not raining. And, um, and then nature, contact with nature is incredibly important to me, which is why I live out here in the bush, far, far away from the bustling city of mm -hmm. Melbourne. Not that it's bustling at the moment. It's, uh, it's like a ghost town. Mm -hmm. David, I'm wondering, I'm really curious about the way you describe that news. Can you just tell us a little bit more about that? You said that you have to be connect in, in contact with the sacred. Can you just like, because that's, I find that idea really appealing. I'm wondering if you could just tell us a bit more about that. Well, it's an intuitive faculty. Um, I do a lot of meditation and, and prayer, but sometimes uh, the intuition tells me that I'm not to write because I'm repeating myself, for instance, or the thought that occupies me at the moment, I've already written two books on it. So why would I want to go back to that? And um, so I feel that, um, see, my, my background is, is quite different from Irene's. Uh, I'm writing from a secular point of view, not a religious or a church point of view. And, um, I don't think God, and I'm sure you people don't think either, that God is uh, somehow favours those who are in churches and synagogues and mosques and temples. So my view is that this, the sacred is everywhere and um, you can't keep the sacred out and that the secular world is infused with the sacred. And um, I have to get in touch with that, otherwise I can't write at all. So, um, yeah, I have to feel that motivating force in me to, um, to actually say something. And I think the fact that I wrote at night time was significant because that's the time when we're asleep, dreaming or, or praying. And uh, I think we're closer to, well, I hesitate to use the word God I, because as Irene mentioned, God is always a man. I don't like the idea of God as a man. Um, and I don't like the idea of God as a woman either. Uh, but we, I think we create these images of God so that we can relate to God. But God is clearly beyond all those images that we care to make about God. And um, However, whatever metaphors we use, they are still just metaphors. As the uh, French philosopher Derrida puts it, every religious statement is an interpretation of God, not a description of God. I like that. So every, all our ideas of God are interpretations. When I was young, I used to think that, that our images of God were descriptions of God. And I think I went through it a phase of great disillusionment when I realized that all of our religious images were provisional only at best and weren't absolute at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Stephen, does that look like Peter coming in? Yeah. Hi. Am I late? <laughs> I'm late. Have Beautiful New Zealander, you're late. Yeah. Sorry. I thought no, it was that's all right. Hard. That's that's fine. Um, I am just going to try and find you, <laughs> which is easier said than done when you're on these big calls, because um, I want to introduce you. Where are you? There you are. Wonderful. Okay. Oh, thanks, Stephen. Wonderful. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome, Peter. Uh, Peter is an author based in New Zealand, and I know you've just arrived, but um, 
do you feel ready to talk or because there's a couple of questions I can keep posing to David but oh I'm sorry I, how come I I thought we were starting at one uh, maybe I've got the time oh, sort. that's right we had about five how much have time I, zones. Uh, one of us was much? bound to, <laughs> to mess up no that's absolutely fine um, I just um, just give me one minute um, Peter there was just a couple of questions um, that were posed. I think um, Irene, you were answering some things in the background. One of them was about, Jane asked a question about when you, when you have a gap, when you, you perceive a gap in the market and um, how do you test those ideas? And I wonder whether Irene, you wanted to just uh, answer that. You, you had some answers there, but maybe you could address the group there and give, uh, give Peter a moment to catch himself before we throw to him. Uh, yeah, so so I suggest if you want to test whether people are interested, and I haven't done either of these things, actually. Uh, no, I haven't done the first one. It's, but if you've got access to a blog, so putting it out there and seeing kind of what kind of response you get. Um, and the other one, of course, is journal articles, depending on what you're wanting to publish, to writing something that's much shorter than, than a book. Because uh, Jane's question was, you know, before you start on writing a whole book, is it a good idea to test it first? And I totally agree, yes. Um, so, so writing, finding some context like that, a magazine or a, a book or a, a journal or, um, or a website where it can be placed and see what kind of response you get, certainly than, than starting writing a whole book. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Irene. Um, Marlene, you had, where are you, Marlene? Um, you had some, uh, there you are. Can you unmute yourself? Um, I'm just going to pop you on spotlight for one second. Marley Marburg, who's a Melbourne-based author, you've written a number of books. Um, just um, what would you like to uh, add to this conversation, Marley? Gosh. Oh, I don't know. Um, I suppose just looking at some of the chats, um, it's interesting, you know, all different questions. And there's a question about e-books, and I suppose that's something... I might be able to say uh, that others haven't said. Um, the experience of, of writing an e-book or getting my e-book published was not there. And, um, yeah, so I've learned a bit from it. And I think that e-books are fantastic, especially for the particular book that I've just, um, well, my most recent book, um, because it needs to get to a wide group of people um, and so the ebook is really accessible and cheap for people um, but it's a really good idea to get your ebook published at the same time as the print copy um, I think that's a really important thing to do to save um, oh, issues with publishers and you know I had to do the ebook I published that myself after I'd had the print book published with the publisher um, and to try and get the rights for that and to pay for it, all the costs of all that. So really, in short, all I can say is that the e-book um, should be uh, published in the beginning. Don't try and do it afterwards like I did. Very costly. Um, so when you say e-book, do you just mean a book that's just available, say, on Amazon? Kindle yeah. or yeah, like or one yeah, one of those. Yeah. 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 So because some of the publishers, like with a print book, some of the publishers don't publish all around the world. So, mm -hmm. you know, and you you know, you write a book that's actually got application worldwide, you want it to be able to be available. So um an ebook is a really good way to do that. Um and also um the reason that publishers don't publish around the world. It's just the, the costs of, of doing that. Um, and they might be small publishers. So, you know, they can't get an agreement to distribute it in other parts of the world or um, whatever. It's just, it's, <laughs> this is a minefield, you know. It is a minefield. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, let's let me pose this question, Marlene. What, what keeps you writing in this minefield of a, you know, of an, of an um, landscape? Look, I agree with David wholeheartedly. I can't not write. That's what it's about. 
And um, especially, you know, I'm a poet. Um, it's not that I only write poetry. I do write other things, but, um, you know, it, it comes from a place that's of prayer, which is a really integrated place. And so you kind of, I know that I'm a poet. And, um, and so if I'm that, then I have to respond to that. You know, I have both an obligation to myself personally, but also to anybody else who might happen to want to read that work. Um, so, yeah, I just can't not write. Um, I do have phases, though. I think that's an interesting um, aspect that other writers might experience, too. I have phases where I write a lot um, and, uh, and easily, and then I have other times where I don't write at all. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's, and I just go with that because I know that the best writing comes from a place where I feel really inspired to do it. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. Um, my, uh, my most recent book is Grace Upon Grace. I've got it here. I haven't got the other books. This is my seventh book. Um, so that's it there. And, um, and the cover was uh, also not mine, although it's quite a nice cover. I got used to it. Um, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's a, a book about, it's a book for a retreatant who's doing the spiritual exercises in this contemporary age. Um, so, yeah, so it's got a big application um, around, around the globe. Wonderful. Thank you, Marlene. Feel free to pop the link in the chat if you like people, if people would like to access that book. So okay. thank you. Sure. It was thank helpful. You. Okay. Um, thanks, Marlene. Let us pop now back to um, Peter. So, Peter, are you, um, have you kind of collected your thoughts? Oh, you're still on mute. Um, I'm unmuted myself now. Good, 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 good. Um, let's, <coughs> let's hear from you and, and your experience. Okay, I, I was, um, wanted to, 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 uh, to talk about the content of a, a book that's just, um, come out this month and I can I just share my screen and, and run through a few things is that all right Kristen yeah I'm not that's fine sure Steve, here. Steve um, might just have to make you host to let you do that oh host. okay there you go <laughs> has my screen been shared okay uh, yes with your with your background photo can you see a, a picture yes yeah Okay, um, so this this is the, the 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 book that just came out. It's how how to talk about spiritual encounters, but the story for me on this went goes back uh, forty years uh, or so. <clears throat> when what interested me about the language and uh, how people communicate about spiritual encounters was the special way in which language was being used. It's something that <laughs> really uh, started me on this journey was to do with um, the, my perception that that, that, that in, in um, European contexts, Anglo-American kind of European contexts, reluctance to talk about spirituality was a strong thing. And one of the things that struck me was David Hayes' work back in the early 80s, where in a sample that he had, he had a quarter of those who'd had spiritual encounters <clears throat> didn't talk to anyone in their life. So it wasn't just reluctance, it was complete silence. So, and I found when I tried to talk to people about it, often the, the preamble was, you might think I'm crazy, but um, <clears throat> the other thing that I noticed is that when people did begin talking about spiritual encounters, they used language competently, even though they hadn't used it very much openly, which suggests to me people are rehearsing to some extent and um, um, talking it through in their own heads around around um, uh, the nature of their experience. So in the book, <clears throat> I developed this theory of provocative gaps, which argues that when people are talking uh, about spiritual encounters, the language is intentionally vague. And what's important in that vagueness is that gaps are embedded in what people are saying. And these gaps provide uh, sites for listeners to turn their to insert their own content. So the idea here is that when people are talking about spiritual encounters, they require the active engagement of their listeners. Um, so they, in order to complete the communication, and hence the suspicion of talking to people who aren't going to be responsive 
and perhaps why people very often stay quiet and and and, and don't perceive the, the, that they're able to talk. So I just want to talk about this theory of provocative gaps and 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 run through them. So the idea here is that it's almost like a, a this sort of um, form letter that you get from the tax department that uh, you've got a whole lot of gaps there that can be filled in. They could, they have to be filled in. You can't say that uh, you're, uh, you can't, you need to put numbers and figures and some, and then put names in other places. So the gaps need to be filled in different ways and people can read. What, but the whole idea is that the, the communication isn't complete until those gaps are completed by the, by the listener. So the, what, I've, what I look at in the book is um, a range of devices, provocative gap devices that people use. And these are four I just want to mention briefly, very briefly. I'd love to talk lots about them. But first is missing content. Second is what I'm, I'm going to call gap shifts, which uh, rely on grammatical shifts within what people say. The fourth is the use of metaphor for, for gap uh, provoking um, purposes. And finally, binary, binary opposition marking. So just starting first with missing content. So these typically take, take a variety of forms. They can be, but, but one of the most common is the just having unfinished sentences and missing out words. So for instance, I might talk about walking along the beach, looking out across the ocean, and the ocean is flat except for a sort of lumpy swell that's going, and I look across into the horizon I see I see light uh, light the sun sort of sprinkling in the distance and I had I just have this feeling I have this feeling of you know I just have this feeling of uh, okay so in this of in this account of of, of intentionally put um, unfinished sentences which prompt the listener to perhaps fill in their own experience to complete what I'm trying to say because I can't put it into words I'm relying on the other person to to fill it out for me and I can do that in a variety of ways using generalizing language and, and not, uh, the book looks at a whole range of ways in which that's done but in written forms of people's accounts written accounts of their spiritual encounters we don't have a high tolerance for um, <laughs> for unfinished sentences, so that so it's more common in written spoken than written accounts. The second um, strategy device I'd like to talk about is shifting grammatical positions. Um, and English language, like oh, I don't know many other languages than English, but uh, is is highly flexible in terms of. Uh, there's a huge grammatical flexibility in how we use words, and and, and we can shift um, the grammatical position of words in a, a range of interesting ways. And I want to look at, uh, firstly, at, at uh, what I'm calling uh, gap shifts and plus shifts. Um, so plus shifts dem demand higher a range of content and gap shifts uh, require less. So just looking at that first, looking at plus shifts first, if you take a word like concrete, I can shift it from an object word or a noun into a verb or a, a, a relational term, and talk um, that talk about uh, concretizing. Just as there's many words we use in science, like uh, crystallizing, and all sorts of words that we we use by uh, by changing the grammatical position. So the plus shift needs more content for completion. I have to say what concretizes what to make a complete sentence. Now gap shifts work the other way. They need less content for, for a complete sentence. So if I talk about the an empty box, uh, I could talk about the box as, um, so the box and empty is an attribute or an adjective attached to the box. I can talk about the empty box, the box, box is empty. I can also transpose the term empty into a noun by talking about it, the emptiness of the box or the box's em emptiness. But I can also just leave emptiness by itself. And what that does is create a, a, a space. It creates a space because I don't need to, I can still use emptiness by itself. It doesn't demand more content. But implied that there is what is that which is empty? You know, what is the, 
what, uh, where, is, where does the emptiness lie? What is the empty thing? Um, which prompts a, a receptive listener to insert, again, to insert their own content. There's many of these, and some of them involve a, a, a double shift from a, a noun to a verb. So for instance, a word like love, Bert loves Ruby, we, we're used to specifying who does the loving and, and, and who is loved. Uh, but I can, I can talk about Bert's love of Ruby, and, by, and one step further, I can just talk about love, and that term love leaves it, it unspecified who does the loving and who is loved. Um, so it creates two gaps, if you like, two gaps within what people are saying. Now, these, the use of these transpositional, or sorry, gap shifts are so common and when people start to talk about spiritual, there's, there's hundreds of terms that, that come up and, and I, I'm just throwing up a few of these, but um, you probably recognize some of these terms, a term like oneness, and um, uh, uh, they're really common. Okay, so the examples of gap shifts, uh, this is Arthur Kusler talking about quietude and self-dissolving stillness, oceanic feeling, all of them involving um, shift, shifts from, uh, from normal spaces like quiet to quietude. Um, but also people, when they start talking, use these terms like wholeness, containment, detachment, aversion. These terms are all, um, some of them are single, involve one gap, some of them involve two gaps. Um, so attachment, usually something attaches to something. So there's two gaps there. Um, wholeness is an adjective. Whole was how we usually have it, but we transpose it into wholeness. Okay, the third gap I, I, I want to, the third gap provoking strategy I talk about is, is metaphor. Um, I think of metaphors as a more concrete, a concrete way of speaking about something that's less concrete or more abstract. Um, but in particular, I favour the uh, uh, looking at metaphor as a, uh, involving uh, structural mapping of similarities between a range of objects. So, it's, so it's it's the congruence of that of that of the relationships between objects that are important. I think with metaphor, and they have the potential also to embed gaps in this structural mapping that's going on. Um, so, so there are many examples. A very common example is reference to fluid. Fluids, in particular, the ref reference to um, ideas of depth, uh, surfaces, uh, metaphors that draw on our interaction with uh, with uh, uh, with fluid spaces. And so, in this example of a metaphor, the person here stands over and ha it, it, it is relating to a number of objects: the ear the surface of the water, the shallow part of the water, the deep part of the water, and the base. So if we look at this structural mapping here of this metaphor, we have the person and a number of objects, including the air, surface, shallow water, deep water, and base. Now that maps onto the, uh, the world, perceived reality, the underlying reality, but then there's the other bits. What are they? How do they fit? Um, perhaps even extraordinary reality is something that is a big question mark. Um, and, and perhaps uh, definitely the base is left un, unspecified within the metaphor, which again creates a space for re uh, responsive listeners to uh, insert their own content. The fourth strategy I just want to touch briefly on is binary opposition marking. I've been really interested, firstly, in analog marking, which in is the imposition of changes to typefaces, to putting inverted commas around things, underlines, uh, dotted dots, um, a whole range of ways where you, you mark a particular term with a in, in, in a in a particular way. In this case, I've got inverted commas as the mark. The, I saw the atoms and the elements of those in my body participating in this cosmic dance of energy. I feel its rhythm and I heard its sound. So the, what Capra's done is put um, inverted commas which leave it ambiguous, at least it unsure where things stand. Of course, there's a long history of, of uh, analog marking in all sorts of forms, in pictorial forms and, <clears throat> and, and similar marking, but 
but in elaborate ways. Binary opposition marking does the same thing, but these, this involves words that sit next to a noun, often an adjective, that don't add extra meaning, but they put they put an, they add emphasis to the term. So um, in these examples, you've got reference to noiselessness, noiselessly, untellable, infinitely. They're binary because an untellable lesson is also referencing a tellable lesson. Uh, just as in advertising, you talk about a new drill, um, uh, implying that there are other drills that are old. So the binary opposition marking kind of plays on the binary terms and marks marks the term that's been talked about in a special way. Um, and so these are these are uh, are, are common um, common ways of marking and creating marking. Within in that, and again, it creates a a hole or a gap uh, for people to insert what they're thinking. And the unmarked object is present in the marked object. Okay, so having looked at some a whole range of different devices, and I've touched on four. Um, I was interested to see do, are these actually used when people uh, talk about spiritual encounters, and how often are they used? So I, I took a bunch of written accounts uh, from, um, divided them into sentences, entered them into a computer, and each sentence was presented randomly to two independent judges uh, who, according to the criteria we developed, we, we reached a point of around 90% agreement between the two. So the first thing, looking at two samples, uh, looking at published authors, so these were uh, these were accounts by published authors, and then looking at another group of, of, of accounts of spiritual encounters by, by, by just personal accounts. As you can see here, firstly, missing, gaps by missing content weren't common. As I said before, it's in written forms, it's, it's not a common device. But gap shifts and metaphors were very common. Um, they reached, you know, almost one per sentence which I, uh, um, I, I think I was surprised how, 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 how frequently they occurred. And binary opposition marking to, to some extent was reasonably common as well. So the next question I had was, well, is this unique? So the people talking about, is this, this gap provoking approach unique to um, uh, spiritual encounters? So I then asked a group of people to uh, the same people to provide a travel, a dream, and a spiritual experience. So they, uh, they a travel experience, a dream experience, and spiritual experience. It's kind of thinking that a dream experience might be closer to the spiritual than uh, because of the subjective, na more subjective nature of it. But when when we analysed the um, the frequency of strategies, as you can see there, the the gap provoking strategies that we've talked about were were far more common, um, particularly gap shifts and metaphors than in the other accounts. So, yeah, I, I guess uh, my background's in clinical psychology, so I'm particularly interested in the importance of people's uh, spiritual encounters for their, um, for their well-being. Um, and I'm kind of thinking, how do we perhaps I noticed amongst my colleagues that often they didn't talk to people about their spiritual encounters. And I wonder if it's a, a, a lack of confidence with the, with the, uh, the genre, the, the, the gap provoking nature of the genre. So I, I, I could see a room for us to encourage more comfort with vagueness. Um, the use, um, more Confidence in the use of gap shifts in, in reflections and validations with, 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 with people that we work with. Um, and perhaps developing and fostering a, a, a broad um, repertoire of metaphors that also uh, validate and uh, legitimate people's conversations about spiritual encounters. So that's where I got to. Um, I, I hope that's interesting. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Um, Jane just asked if you could hold up your book again or pop it in the chat. She was interested in getting a copy. Um, I, have a, I have a question, Peter, about when people go from some, saying something like, I felt empty to 
there was a deep emptiness within, you know, that change of from kind of, um, I wonder whether that changes the relationship with the phenomenon. Do you know what my question, what I'm trying to get? Do you then create like a, an objective, like you're looking at it differently? Do you know what I'm trying to say? Um, no, I'm, I'm struggling. Sorry. Oh, okay. So say, for example, um, I, um, what I'm trying to think is when I did my research, um, I looked at this phenomenon that happens when people go from talking about an experience. So I was here and I was doing this and then this happened to this phenomenon that happens when people kind of take a step back. So they go from being the protagonist to being like a theorist. So suddenly they've got this, they're looking at it from a different perspective. Um, and I wonder whether what the impact of language has on that. When we change the language, does it change the relationship to the experience? Yeah. I, I, something I didn't touch on was the way in which the, the sort of sequential nature of, of gap forming within a, in a um, person's account. So often people start with, with pretty concrete references, you know, the place they were in, the, what they were looking at, uh, was amongst the trees and, uh, uh, but then as they go through the track, the um, language becomes progressively more vague because I think they're moving from uh, an, a description to trying to capture the meaning of, of the experience. So they're talking much more in, in abstract, in abstract terms. And, and I, I think the first part's pretty important because it anchors the experience mm -hmm validates the experience but as a person talks more and more they're getting into uh how, how uh, they're, they're actually doing the process of the account they're making the transition that i think you might be talking about from the the kind of anchored ex description of the experience to then trying to convey the meaning i think it's the conveying of the meaning that's really important that this and and where the gap Provoking language is so important because it because it is so hard to put into words. Um, you really do need the assistance of the listener in in, um, in, 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 in conveying what what the experience meant. Don't yeah. Know if that's, that's yeah. No. Important. No. I think it is in the meaning making. I think it is. I think you've nailed it. One of the things that strikes me as a spiritual director, we have a room full of spiritual directors, is the role of the spiritual director in honoring those silences. I mean, you know, they're very common in spiritual direction. People will have those gaps where they're, they're searching for the right word. And, you know, that role of just sitting there and creating that safe and nurturing space for them to, to search and find and, you know, try out a few words. Yeah. Isn't, no, it's not quite that. Yeah. I guess I wonder about, you know, if you're a group of spiritual directors, that's different than, people whose lives don't cross spiritual life very much, you know, how, how in those contexts might we foster like nurses or doctors or um, I don't know, just hundreds of people who, who, who may have the opportunity to, to enter conversations and don't with people around their spirituality. Um, so I, I just wondered what your thoughts are around fostering um, yeah, and, people's and, and maybe, willingness. Yeah, and maybe our unique gift in listening to those gaps and encouraging meaning making. Um, you know, I think we do need to get out and we do need to help, you know, healthcare professionals and other people. Um, and I think we do in all our own ways, in our own networks. Um, but that's very much part of, part of that because there is something unique about that listening stance in those places of the gaps but i think maybe we can share with other with other professions can i just uh, say something Kristen? yes you can baby oh just um thanks for that presentation peter it's uh, mm. very interesting um this sad thing that we say to each other you may think i'm crazy but you know whenever i'm in that kind of context i realize that i'm in the wrong context um, mm that it's so lovely to be able to, for instance, you know, in New Zealand with Maori people, you wouldn't begin 
talking to Maori person saying, you may think I'm crazy, but. So what you're talking about is exclusively related to sort of uh, Anglo uh, American, uh, you know, sort of modern people. And that when I'm with Aboriginal people, if I want to talk about spirituality, um, I do not have to preface it with, you may think I'm crazy, but. And so, um, so what you're really interested in, Peter, it seems to me, is the grammar of spirituality, aren't you? The grammar of it, how it's actually conveyed yeah. in words and language, I think. And that's yeah. very interesting because yeah. there hasn't been much written on that, but you did mention earlier in your presentation that David Hay, that's H-A-Y, was also very interested in that. The, the words people choose to use in describing spiritual experiences. And he found, uh, as you know, Peter, David was a great friend of mine. Um, and I'm very sad he's passed on. But he found that when he would go around England asking people about their spiritual experiences, and God in particular, that one of the most uh, common expressions was, no, I don't believe in God, but that was the, the most, 90% of the people said, I don't believe in God, but I do believe in a higher power or, or I do believe in, you know, a, a world spirit or blah, 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 blah. And what he found was that the idea of God that people have is so choked up and so limiting and so crippling of their imagination that they had to kind of get rid of it in order to talk about their experience of God. And that shows that our culture, at least our Anglo culture, is in a state of great crisis when it comes to sharing our spiritual experiences. Your comment on that? Yeah, I, I guess one of my motives was realising that in New Zealand, probably Australia, probably in the 60s and 70s, there was a big move away from organised religions. And in an organised religious context, you have a vocabulary, uh, you have gap forming, like God, I suppose, could be treated as a super gap in the sense that but yeah. there's many terms, heaven. But like myself, we kind of rejected all that. Um, but people still go on having spiritual encounters. Um, yes. That's right. But we've, but we've lost spaces, spaces where we can talk about them. And I think the talking about them is so important in terms of processing and legitimizing that part of, part of oneself. And I, yeah, I, th I, I think it is a bit of a crisis in terms of how, how, do, we, how do we foster a, an alternative to uh, what we've had for so long, which is the, um, the, the, the opportunities for gap-provoking conversations in religious context, how do we promote it with, how does it develop, how might it develop outside of the yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, thank you very much. It was really interesting. I'd never seen, um, I haven't seen anything written on that. So I want to particularly thank our three authors, um, Irene, David and Peter. It's been a fascinating uh, morning. And just before we go to the break, I do want to go to Stephen. Stephen, do you just want to, um, I feel like we haven't exactly um, come up with any sort of clear pathways. And I'm wondering whether SDI might have some, you know, kind of easier ways that, that aren't quite so complex. So. Um, absolutely. Uh, I'm so grateful to, I'm just seeing if I can get myself here going. I'm so grateful to all of the authors who presented. Um, and I do have a response. I wanted to see if I can make myself appear here. There we go. Um, uh, to each of you, uh, Peter, thank you um, for that uh, insightful and thought provoking presentation. It strikes me in my own personal experience as a spiritual independent. This is just as a, another human being spiritual human being, uh, as we all are, I think, that when we talk about spirituality, we're really inviting somebody to dance. And if you can think about 
asking someone to dance in a social situation is often a little bit as <laughs> body English, there's nervousness, and there's a real sense that you might be rejected. And I think um, it is about relationship making, even if we're just talking in our private selves, uh, in our prayers, in our meditation, in our thoughts, are we acceptable here? with God or however God is named, with this greater and deeper connection. And so the gaps are really an invitation to be affirmed in many ways. That's, that's how I feel it as another human being. I also had a response to you, Irene. You said you weren't any good at marketing. And my experience of marketing is that uh, if you think of it as being of service to others, it can change your whole approach. Um, and I have this feeling that nothing is separate from anything else in life. And if you think of authoring a book uh, as trying to bring something in the world that other people can enjoy and experience, then it's kind of hard to imagine that book not typeset or even if it's just an audiobook recorded, not put in some way that's accessible. And if you think of the marketing as a way to let people know that it exists, you're trying to be of service to them. And that that can be a concrete act. Um, uh, you mentioned writing blogs, by actually taking a part of it that you think will be valuable to certain people. And it can be a tiny part, clergy who are women, who are over 65, whatever you want to do, or anybody who's mildly interested in spirituality. And then you try and take part of your book as an excerpt. Maybe you write a little introduction for it and you keep it short and you find a place to, to put it out there, even if it's your own blog, you are being of service and you're also inviting someone in and there is no shame in that. Uh, I think it is very much a part of the writerly effort. And I want to, I say that to everybody because I assume everyone on the call is interested in storytelling and writing and publishing. This is a service that we do for others. I do really respect David when he said, and Marlene when they said, look, I can't not do this. But part of the reason, I think, if you asked yourself, why can't I not do this, is that there's a little bit of, or maybe a lot of a calling in it. And we aren't called to do things because I think it's just an itch to be scratched. We're called because they bring meaning into our life, and often that's about service. So, and David, you also said that you weren't good at marketing, but I noticed that you managed to get every one of us to remember your titles by yourself feigning not to remember them <laughs> and then inviting someone else to read it for you <laughs> if that's not marketing i don't know what it is that was brilliant oh, thanks, i want you to um i'm going to stick you very briefly i i don't want to take any more time than possible through the opportunities within sdi to be published and publishing here is in this broader sense of today's world, which means if you get something in our, we call it SDI stories, um, used to be called our blog, that is publishing on the web. If you are published in one of our online publications, that is also publishing. Books are wonderful things. I love books, I'm a writer myself, but it's not the only thing you can do. So I'm gonna show you how, how you can do that. But first I have an important question because I'm a storyteller. And I want you to, uh, I'm gonna cancel my spotlight. I'm gonna put everybody up here so I can see you all. All right, it's not a tough one, but raise your hand if you know the story of um, Hansel and Gretel. Who can tell me, you can write it in the comments, how they managed to find their way home. Anybody remember? Francis, unmute yourself. They dropped breadcrumbs on the way. Bread so crumbs. they'd find their way home. So they could find their trail. So what I'm going to do right now, I also like the idea, I've heard this story told as little pebbles that were white and polished and they shone in the moonlight. I love that image, that stuck with me. Um, Scratch a reader and you'll find, a, scratch a writer and you'll find a real lover of reading underneath. That's me. Um, 
So I'm going to show you the breadcrumbs so you can find your way. I'm going to share my screen and show you how to find the way to information about SDI's public publishing opportunities. Not everybody's going to write a book, but everybody has a story to tell. I really believe that. So it's a question of finding the story that really resonates deeply with you. Because uh, if it does, it's likely to find someone else that it will resonate with. So here is our website. Very recently, we changed our, um, uh, our, uh, our website name. We used to be SDI World, but now if you uh, see up here, it's sdicompanions.org. Um, so you can look there. And then what I want you to do is remember, these are the breadcrumbs. You want to go to media, all right? Media, in some places, is media's reaction to an organization, but here is, it's our own media. And I'm just going to show you where to find things. Let's start with books, since we've been talking about books. SDI is a publisher of books. So you just click on that, and lo and behold, as the um, wheels in our website um, churn, you should be able to see SDI Press. Most of our books have to do with spiritual companionship, which is a large group that includes spiritual direction, which is very much uh, still a main root system for our, um, uh, for our organization, which is a nonprofit educational one. But it also includes chaplains and life coaches and anyone who is using deep listening, respecting the agency of the person they're listening to and having some sense that the deep con deeper connection that uh, someone has, the spirituality, whatever tradition it comes from, is a way to wholeness for them. And that the spiritual companion has some experience in helping people find that wholeness. So here's an example of some of the stories we've published. This is some of the books. This is a book just out. It's become the fastest selling book we've ever had. It's by Lucy Abbott Tucker, one of our co-founders. Um, it's about spiritual direction supervision. And if you're a spiritual director, you know this is an essential part of how you keep yourself, uh, I won't say honest, but it's how you get input and be able to bring up things. Many, many, many professions have supervision built into them. And this is about um, Lucy's ideas about this. And here's a book about learning how to tell your our most life-giving story, recreating a life. This is by Diane Millis. It's a great book and it was chosen one of the best spiritual books of 2019 by Spirituality and Practice. You don't know spirituality and practice is a great place to go to get your book reviewed if you write about spirituality it's also a great place to read reviews of other books so it's pretty wonderful and then we have uh, a number of books that uh, were published in years past we sell them all through our website but they're also on amazon so okay Maybe you're interested in submitting something. So if you go to here and then you can't, you see it says submit. And if you click that, I will show you just very quickly that here's the way you submit your proposal. So you're gonna to go to media and you go down to books and you submit your proposal. There's submission guidelines. Again, I will click on that. That's a PDF, which has the details. I'm not going to go through them right now. Um, and, um, uh, also uh, a, tem a template so that you can apply. So it's fairly straightforward, but obviously the book part is up to you and um, how you think it will resonate with our community. I wouldn't be afraid about doing something that was um, a bit out of the box that, uh, that uh, thought of, used the idea of spiritual companionship as a way to talk about how we are present to each other Henry Nouwen used to talk about being a spiritual friend and almost all of his spiritual direction, and he was quite brilliant in talking about spiritual direction, was done informally on the fly because that's the kind of guy he was. But I love the idea that we bring some of the deep listening techniques into our everyday relationships. And what a revolution would it be if our everyday relationships had this kind of listening and co-listening it's one of the things that inspires me every day. If you keep going down this list, or if you go up on the list, you'll see stories of companionship. I'll just click on that briefly. This is um, what we used to call our blog. And you can see that there's a variety of things here. Why spiritual companionship requires the removing of hats. I usually put together 
a, an image for it. The pieces are 500 to 800 words long, but if you write something 1200 that's fantastic, I'm probably gonna use it. Um, and uh, even things like statement from the coordinating council, I'm a spiritual midwife, we, I particularly favor stories from spiritual companions about practical wisdom of how they do, what they do, new techniques they have, and also the personal story of how they got into it and how they are evolving because we do a great service to our membership. And for those who don't know, we have about 6,700 members, paying members in 42 countries who are all spiritual companions. Um, and um, this is uh, the audience you'll have. And we also have a mailing list of 17,000 people around the world who are just interested in the topic. So that's our blog. Can you speed it up? Yeah. Sorry? Can, we, can you speed it up? We're, we haven't, we're running out of time. I'm sorry. All right. I'm going to speed it up. Sorry, Kristen. Uh, okay. I, won't, I won't talk about it, but if you find your way to media, you will, um, you will uh, find all the other things that you need. I'll stop sharing now. And if you have any questions, I will put my email in the um, chat right now. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. I'm just conscious of time. So let us take a break. Um, if we can take maybe nine minutes, come back at about nine, um, 35, <laughs> wherever you are in the world, in about nine, eight, nine minutes. Um, and then we will um, have two wonderful roundtable presentations from Anna Killigrew and Noel Kvicting. Um, so go grab a cup, here, cup of, do whatever you need to do, and we'll see each other back in um, at 35. Cool. Thanks, everyone. kilometers west of Kalgoorlie and she is going to talk about desert spirituality so over to you Anna I look forward to hearing your contribution. Thanks Kirsten so I for 15 years I've been offering retreats at this home Kura retreat which is as Kristen said 160 kilometers west of Kalgoorlie and um, people often say when they've had some experience here they have a sense of awe and wonder at the way their experience affects them and they talk about changes in them and one time I had a group of mixed people some who'd been before and some who hadn't and the ones who'd been before were explaining what would happen to the ones who hadn't been saying Kura this and Kura that and at the feedback session at the end of the retreat one woman said Look, when I got here, I was really um, annoyed because people were saying Kura this and Kura that. And I'm thinking, what is this Kura? And now I'm saying Kura this and Kura that. So I know something huge has happened inside me. And um, I want to know what that is. And so I set off to set out to try and discover what is this Kura this, Kura that, that people talk about? What is it that's happening in them in the desert? What's the effect? And how do we um, name it, celebrate it, share it, pass it on? And um, hopefully it will help other people, if I write about it, to explore their own uh, the um, spiritual work that they have to do whenever they find their own wild places, because this is a wild place. It's a place from which to experience the wilderness and explore desert spirituality alone and in community. That's our soundbite. So... As I set out to try and find out what is it that's happening, I've got the research material of about 150 retreats over the 15 years, and I've led these retreats, and I've shared them with about a 1,000 pilgrims, and I've had those conversations that they've had, then they continue to share with me through, as they come back year after year and sit around the campfire or put things in the visitor's book or on Airbnb reviews or by email or Zoom or spiritual direction. So that's my research material. Now, my research tools is the gift of narrative, the scriptural reflection, the juxtaposition of the narrative of the people and what is my own spiritual tradition and richness that I bring to my listening to their story. And I also like to do a bit of a socio-economic uh, Politico religious analysis of the times that we're living in because that is the context in which we're having our spiritual experiences. And I contemplate the presence of the wilderness in which I live. And my strategies to create is to create a liminal space for each particular group. First of all, 
around the campfire, which is set as a ring inside a cloister in the desert under a big sky and with minimal human constructs to distract us from the spiritual realms. And I, I sit with a group, I listen to their talk and I watch their body language and I hear their words and I really loved what Peter Adams was saying about the spaces in the, in the talk. And I try in that way to intuit the needs of this particular group at this particular time to relate to what is on offer in the place here. So I pull out of my toolbox some sort of tailored excursion that immerses that those retreatants in a variety of unconstructed environments around us and lets them find their own path into those zones between the inhabited city from which most people come and the call of the beyond as Carlo Coretta, that uh, desert contemplative would say. So after their experience, we returned to the fire under the sky and held in the wilderness and held in the community that's formed because everybody shares in common tasks for the common good. Um, the, many, if people want it and if they're Christian, we share the Anglican cycle of prayer because I'm an Anglican priest and so is my husband. And in this liturgically created liminal zone, people find expression for what happens to them in the wilderness. I inquire, I listen, I affirm, I offer spiritual literacy, and I encourage the person who's, whose comments are, I like the yellow beetle, to create some more words around that concrete experience and ponder those things. And I ponder these things in my heart too. So my goal in re this research and trying to write is to offer a challenge to the traditional models of spirituality that we have in Australia. We express our spirituality from the place of the inhabited city and with the echoes of our countries of origin in our hearts and in our heads and in our language and in our structures. And we might even do our spiritual direction wearing these lenses in these frames. If we do, we are distorting what's happening before us, in us and around us in this land and in the people within it. So I hope to share what happens in what I call god sown country as we feel for the spiritual presence of the creative word in, the, in a place that hasn't been architecturally or economically or politically manipulated and interpreted to us. So I want to share two stories because I see the structure that holds this presence as being something in story. It is a story. My first story is called The Hermit Hut. For seven years in the 1990s, I am drawn to spend 24 hours each week in a remote hut high on a hill near Gijigana three quarters of an hour drive out of Perth where I work. I spy this hut while I'm taking my new parish on a picnic soon after my arrival in Perth from Melbourne. This hut is eight foot by 10 foot in the old measurements with a small rainwater tank and a shovel and a basin in a little tin shed for ablutions. You get there by a kilometer walk through the bush. So I leave my car at the retreat entrance and I fall into the walking energy that's arising from a sheep track that wanders through a paddock beside the local creek. Already I'm aware of entering another world, a pastoral scene, a timeless zone where grass grows and wind blows and water gurgles and sheep graze. I cross the creek on a log bridge. The bridge is a second threshold on my journey to the hermit hut. It's a place from which to gaze into the still or the turbulent waters, depending on the season and the rainfall. The track has become a song line for me as I note each stage and change along the way. The next sign along the way is my is my passing of a farm dam, which has its muddy water and its earthen wall. This is where sheep sit to um, get the evaporative cooling in the summer and where kangaroos tentatively come down warily wanting a drink. And this place is a zone where the animals of the wilderness mix with the domestic animals of the farm. 
The track becomes a fire break as I climb through a fence and I leave the pasture and the pastoral scene behind. This fence is my third threshold. It's the gateway to a hillside of Jarra woodland with its acacia and banksia understory and it's a fragrant and abundant wildflowers for many months of the year. With my day pack of food essentials, writing and reading materials, my spare underwear and a bag for my rubbish and a candle, I pick up my pace uphill to a tiny cleared site beside a granite rock outcrop. I come to experiencing reaching this site as a coming home each Thursday evening. It has become a sacred place for me. As I locate the key and open the door, I slip off my burden. I say hello to the surroundings, open the door and step in. This is my fourth threshold. I light my candle to disperse the dark, spread my sheet on the narrow bed, put my food on the shelf and sit at the desk. Each week, rain or fair weather, I sit there in peace, gazing into the night sky. There's a spreading Mary gum tree in the middle distance beyond the neighboring granite rock. This is my companion tree. My eyes fix on it from a chair or the bed as my whole being, heart, mind and strength slip into a contemplative space. Out of this contemplative space, I ponder anew the ascribed scriptures for the following Sunday, and I add to this input the relevant biblical commentaries that I photocopied. In the candlelight, I am fully present to what is before me. After a good night's sleep, I'll turn those pages over and write my Sunday sermon with the parishioners in my heart. When a parish antagonist once asked me why I take Friday rather than the conventional Monday as my weekday off, I reply that it's so that I can pause from busyness and bring my best to worship on Sunday, not just have an exhaustion break after the event. Eating in the hermit hut is a simple affair, cereal, cheese and biscuits, fruit and nuts, water, black or green tea. Activity is simple too. I wander the bush off track and scramble over granite boulders to sit as though in an eerie with where the, the eagles soar. Over time, the seasons change. While flower and day length changes. The moon phases come and go. The sun dips and rises in the sky as the earth rolls ever eastward. Every 24 hour stay is different from the last and different to the next. My body waste, I bury in deep compost holes that I dig where the soil is friable. I wash my body in rainwater in a bucket. Life is at its simplest. The basics of life are there, and that is abundance. There are no human constructions beyond the donga to draw my attention or to interpret this experience. It's almost unmediated certainly unmediated by built environments. As I look at the timbered horizon from this hillside vantage point, I can feel the distance call me toward an unknown, call me beyond who I am and what I know. It's with this calling in mind that I take my next parish council on retreat, sit them in front of that horizon and say, it's as though that is where we want to go and these valleys and hills are the way to get there. I am good at seeing the horizon, but some of you will be good at negotiating the in-betweens. Do you want to make this journey too? And we're off on our parish planning agenda. Back in ministry and back in domestic bliss of my daily life, 
I can conjure that tree, that granite rock, and that far horizon as I sink into my daily contemplative chair. The Hermit Hut weekly practice has come to live within me. It is still here. The walk to this hut has thresholds to take me deeper and deeper into mystery. And the weekly drawing apart from all that consumes my attentions is to enter a liminal zone in which to await the mystery of the presence of God. And the metaphors in which this presence of God is manifest. This story is another one about my experience of desert spirituality. I have spent 19 years as a single parent with four children and I'm finally free to follow my dream. One day my friend Peter and I set off on a salvage operation 600 kilometres inland to the gold mining town Kalgoorlie to collect the bishop's spare shed. As we travel along, Peter says to me, you know, I've been reading the Anglican prayer book, the marriage service, and I think I could say all those things to you. I say, is that a marriage proposal? And so we begin to plan our married life. We plan to spend a 10-day honeymoon at a remote salt lake in the middle of West Australia's desert. It's a salt lake said to be on the path of the Seven Sisters Dreaming. It's a salt lake on which sculptor Anthony Gormley has installed 51 naked brass figures, an artwork that explores what it means to be inside Australia not just cling to its coastal cities. Our plan is to set up camp on the shore of that 35 kilometre long lake. We set off with my father in tow. He plans to accompany us as far as Kalgoorlie to have a look at the Australian inland. On the way, Peter pulls off the highway to show dad how to get water from the pipeline. This is a 800 millimetre diameter pipe, like an umbilical cord between Kalgoorlie and tying it to the coast. Now, while these two are exploring the valves and the engineering wonders of the water pumping station, I am feeling an intense drawing to something that lies out of sight along that pipeline. When I ask Peter, who knows this area, what's down there? He dismisses my urge to follow my nose, saying, it's just an access path along the pipe. He's keen to get to Kalgoorlie and to deposit my father and to get on our way. So I don't follow my hunch that something is calling me along that track. We camp alike along, alongside Lake Ballard. We immerse ourselves in the spirit of that place. We take long walks, enjoy the sun and moon and big skies as the earth spins eastward. And we just do together. What work would use this combination of our skills and our experiences? Well, we both love what happens to our spirit in the wilderness. So we start talking about how to share that experience with others. That's when we plan to offer wilderness retreats, but where? We look around the country for the right place to set up a base camp. We draw a couple of disappointing blanks, our plan for going nowhere fast. A couple of months after our honeymoon, we we're again on the road between Kalgoorlie and Perth for work. And again, we're casting around for the right place for our base camp for wilderness retreats. And again, we have a dead end inquiry. We are disappointed. Wondering what to do, Peter says, let's pull off the road down here at the number seven tank and get water from the pipeline and boil a billy for a cup of tea. I mean, that's what any self-respecting Anglican would do at a time of crisis. 
So we take a turn off the highway toward the pipe, but we take the wrong turn. This track doesn't lead to the pump station and that tap on the pipe. It takes us instead to the place that has been calling to me since that first day of our honeymoon. I take one look at the place and I say, this is it. This wrong turning takes us right to the place in which we have lived for the past 15 years, offering wilderness retreats and enjoying the gifts that unconstructed wilderness can offer our souls. You finished, Anna? That was beautiful. Thank you. Such um, beautiful imagery coming up of the heart and the, and the, uh, the pipes. And I'm so glad you found your house, <laughs> your home. Mm. Thank you. Um, I feel like we just need to take a moment just to pause and hold those two beautiful stories in your experience. Mm, thank you, Anna. Really appreciate your contribution. Um, let us now go to Noel. So we're going to have some time at the end of Noel's presentation for questions and responses. Um, but let us go to Noel um, and a very different part of the world and a very different topic. Noel is a well, if, if, if your topic uh, title is still the same, cultivating inner hospitality using internal family systems and the supervision of spiritual directors. So um, looking forward to hearing, um, hearing your presentation. Thanks, Noel. Thank you, Kristen. Um, it looks like it's a very different uh, thing that I'll be talking about, but as I was listening to Anna and as she, as she spoke about the outer space, the external space and its effect and call on us. Um, my uh, really interest and motivation in talking about this is the the landscape of, of the heart, the inner landscape of the soul, and a way of um, allowing a framework of a common language to um, to bring about really, particularly for us practitioners, to speak more and and have some fresh words to say about uh, our experiences and the inner landscape of our, of our hearts. Um, so they say that there's no better illustration or teacher than experience. So please indulge me as I lead you to a bit of a, a brief contemplative exercise as a way of introducing our conversation today. So I invite you to sit comfortably as much as you can with feet flat on the floor and to just orient yourself where you are to feel your chair supporting you, supporting your weight, and just being aware of the firmness of the ground beneath your feet. And you might want to close your eyes as I invite you to take a moment to go within. taking a few deep breaths, few cleansing breaths, and going within when you're ready. As you go inside yourself, I invite you to notice the different parts of you that are present at this moment. Perhaps there's a part that's worried about lunch or a part that is inquisitive and eager to learn. A, mark, a part might feel exhausted or excited. Another part might feel detached or distracted. And maybe there's a part that's just lingering at the corner of our consciousness. 
without judgment and with lots of compassion, simply notice and welcome each part. Now one part might be drawing your attention and maybe wants to say something to you at this moment. Let's just pause for a bit and extend some spaciousness to that part. Let's welcome that part by listening with openness and compassion. How's it going? Good. Great. Right. When you're ready, I invite you to extend that same compassion and spaciousness to all that is within you, both known and unknown, to all the parts that are with you in this moment. Now take a deep breath, and when you're ready, gently open your eyes, look around, and join, join us back in this meeting room. What, what we have experienced through that brief contemplative exercise is what is often called a direct access to our inner life. And in that exercise, we experience a phenomenon that psychological researchers call multiplicity. Multiplicity is this reality that while we perceive ourselves as one person, we're actually a universe within. We're a multitude within. We have what we call technically as sub-selves, or what is colloquially known as parts. And you will have noticed that I've used that parts language in our contemplative exercise. So imagine a conversation with someone wherein someone asks, are you going to Stephen's wedding? And the person who's kind of still making a decision might say, I'm not sure. A part of me wants to go, but another part of me is worried who would take care of the kids while we're gone. Without being conscious of it, we recognize intuitively our own multiplicity. We experience our parts as distinct from each other, yet somehow connected to each other and dynamically related to one another. It is as if we have an internal network, an internal relational world. And this phenomenon has been called internal family systems, or IFS, by Richard Schwartz, its, its founder. IFS is considered an evidence-based approach that started with psychotherapy. At the moment, it's gaining traction and is now a multi- and interdisciplinary network framework. The IFS tenet that all parts are welcome has found its way into the field of spirituality. A few IFS practitioners has written about They've written about spirituality, mostly from a Christian perspective, but a few within a, a Buddhist tradition, and some also from a neo-pagan shamanistic perspective. Last June, as one of the responses to the pandemic, Richard Schwartz and Jenna Rimursma had an IFS-informed conversation entitled, Where is God when the world is falling apart? It's available on YouTube if you want to have a look at it. Um, however, there seems to be little that is said about spiritual companioning, uh, particularly the supervision of spiritual directors with regards to the work of spirituality and uh, the internal family systems model. Uh, the concept of multiplicity and part psychology is not new. And most of us who are in the ministry and supervision work would have probably intuitively work around that. However, IFS, the IFS model brought or highlighted another co-phenomenon that has strong resonances with spiritual accompaniment, and especially in the Ministry of Supervision of Spiritual Companions. The IFS model emphasized the self 
with a capital S. The self, also known as self-energy, is not just a part among others. It's the core of each person and manifests itself as a loving, discerning, calm witness. In spirituality, we call this the inner observer, the authentic self, the true self, the ground of our being, the center. And in spiritual direction language, we call these qualities of the self presence. Presence is what we offer to pilgrims, to directees, who are experiencing the push and pulls within and are wanting to grow more in their ability to be and act in presence themselves in their day-to-day lives. lives. The quality of presence is what we desire to cultivate as well in supervision. We want to be fully present, or in Ivas terms, to be in self-energy when we are listening to others so that we could empower them to be the same. In supervision, there's a chance, an opportunity to make explicit the inner multiplicity at work within the spiritual companion during the spiritual direction session and assist them in to grow in presence or in IFS terms, self-leadership. The self in IFS or presence in spiritual direction is like a conductor in an orchestra. So imagine this conductor. It is a unifying and integrating energy that brings a rhythm to all of the parts. Now, all of our parts are good and have good intentions, but they can take over and do take over at times. They can be overwhelming, and some of them would shut down. Sometimes our ability to be in self, to be in presence, is diminished, particularly when our wounded or defensive or tired parts are triggered by an event, something the person said, a personal issue that is kind of at the back of our of our consciousness or there's an issue that is calling for growth or freshness here supervision comes as a supportive venue for the spiritual companion to extend compassion to listen and to assist their ex- activated parts so that it doesn't stand in the way or rather becomes an ally in extending presence to uh, the spiritual companion, the, the pilgrim that is coming to them. Um, you know, we, we talk about bracketing or putting aside these parts uh, when we are sitting in spiritual direction room, but the supervision uh, arena is the space wherein we assist the supervisee to be in presence more and more and to bring some sort of healing or integration of the overwhelm or, or triggered parts. As I mentioned, we we help the supervisee uh, bring more compassion and spaciousness to all that is within. Now, this way or approach to supervision allows the supervisee to go back to the spiritual direction room with parts that are less triggered and able to host the pilgrim, the directly with a freer and more loving presence. So, as a contemplative evocative tool in supervision, an IFS approach is able to give a framework that is experiential and facilitative. There is immediacy to accessing the parts, the parts, the somatic, imaginal, and non-thematic dimension of a supervisor's experience are explored and held. And this is one of the reasons I actually went into IFS, especially in the area of supervision, is because a lot of the more traditional models of, um, of supervision is basically engaged in speaking and feeling. So those arenas, dimensions of the experience of feeling and, um, and thinking. And, and there's a lot also about, there's some imaginal there, but the more somatic, the more non-thematic dimensions of the experience are often in practice uh, a little bit overlooked. So IFS has this way of bringing particularly those um, process-oriented approach to, uh, to our experience as, as companions. Um, in our exploration of the supervisor's experience, we can facilitate what we call an inner conference to see which part shows up. We could use the remembered dialogue form or contemplative reflection forms as tools to discern where the self-energy appears to be increased or decreased and explore why this is so. 
together we can look and discern where the divine presence, the presence might be acting, inviting, holding, both the supervisee and their parts, and their directives and their parts as well. Now, a key intervention in the IFS model is extending compassion, this language of compassion, extending compassion to all of our parts so that we could extend that to others. Now, a lot of research has been done and being done currently about compassion, how compassion activates the different parts of the brain than empathy, and how compassion is more than empathy. Now, compassion inglu includes engagement and response that helps the other to be in presence. When we listen, with all that we are, we do extend compassion. So when we listen to our parts, we do extend compassion to them. Um, compassion is one of the qualities of the self, and it's a renewable resource. Um, research says, some research says that empathy can lead to burnout, but compassion increases energy. So the IFS informed supervision of spiritual directors offers exciting possibilities in the experiential, phenomenological, and intuitive aspects of our practice. Uh, and the main aim of, of this presentation is to have more conversations and more explorations about this, about this kind of uh, modality and interrelatedness uh, with other disciplines. Being an evidence-based approach, the internal family systems framework could offer us new avenues for researchers in the area of spiritual direction and in particular in supervision towards a more common or at least resonant language uh, that could lead to interdisciplinary dialogue and various collaborative work. And in some cases, this is happening already. Um, so I want to conclude this presentation, this short presentation, by, by leaving a phrase from uh, Christine Walter's painter that resonate with an IFS informed supervision practice and where I got the, the title of this presentation from. Christine speaks of inner hospitality, of attending to the strangers within, to welcoming the multitude of visitors in what Rumi calls the guest house of ourselves. So may you extend inner hospitality to every part of you. May you hold space so that others too may extend inner hospitality and compassion to all that is within them. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Noel. Uh, Christine's a, a big member of SDI, made amazing, amazing contributions over the years. Um, let's just take a moment just to hold that and to that really beautiful idea of showing compassion to all the different parts of ourselves. Thank you, Noel, and thank you to Anna. Um, I'm conscious of time. If people need to go, then feel free to do that. Um, if you do have any questions uh, for either of um, the speakers, um, yeah, what someone's asked a question, Noel, about is there any writing that we can read which informs your beautiful wisdom? Uh, is, there a, is there a book um, that you would recommend? on IFS that's a good introduction for people? Oh, did you mute yourself, No, No? I think, yep. Oh, there you go. Hello, can you hear me now? Um, uh, I think the, the good introduction would be Richard Schwartz's um, book, uh, I think called You You Are the One You're Waiting For. Um, mm -hmm. There's a website called uh, uh, IFS Institute. They have a lot of, um, a lot of writings around there. And, um, and I mentioned one other a while ago. They're coming from a more traditional Christian reimagining of, um, you know, of IFS, uh, which is Jenna uh, Remersma, I think that's her, her last name. So um, there's a lot of videos also. Another guy called John Early uh, writes uh, in Self Therapy, uh, which is about really an introduction to. Um, to parts work. I've got uh, that thanks, book. Ross. I think Ross, Ross uh -huh. brought the uh, website in.
Oh yeah, thanks, Rod. Um, I have that book, um, that self therapy. It's it's really good. It has this very simple, clear process that you can work through different patterns that come up in your life, and you know, yeah, old wounds and things. It's it's very accessible and good. Someone has asked for your email details. Can I pop your email? Yes, into yes, that? please. Um, that that that'd be okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, any other, where are you? Let me just pop that email in and then I probably won't make cricket to get you to do it. <laughs> Why isn't it coming up? Do you want to pop it in? I could, um, I could do it. All right. And Anna, people are asking to contact you in your retreat center. Would you mind popping in your, um, email address? And it's the Kura Retreat Centre, is that right? Yeah. Oh, you're muted, Anna. Okay. Someone's already put our website up on in the chat. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, just while I'm waiting for any other questions that are coming up, just to remind you that the next um, research symposium will be on the, let me double check the date, it's the 17th of September. Same time, Thursday. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, Mel. Um, and what we've, uh, I'm going to begin with a conversation with Tim McCowan, who was here before. I'm not sure whether Tim is still on. Tim, there you are. Still here, yes. Hi, great. Thanks, Tim. So, Tim and I are going to have a conversation because Tim hasn't just got one PhD, he has two PhDs. So, um, sorry. The other of ministry. Well, you know, still two big, huge pieces of work. So Tim, and Tim also supervises um, students. So he and I are going to be in conversation talking about, both from the student's perspective, about how you begin the research process, how you find your methodology, how you find a supervisor, as well as from the supervisor's perspective about how you, um, you know, what makes a good, what makes a good supervisor, how we find good ways of working together, a uh, good sort of student-supervisor relationship. So we're going to begin um, with the conversation with Tim. Then I have a three-minute thesis competition, 3MT, and I have five participants already, but there's a couple more slots. So if anybody has some research that they would like to share in that three-minute thesis um, format, then please email me. Um, and then we have a, um, yep, and then I've also got a round table with Carol, who was actually on, on before. So, um, Carol, are you still, there you are. Um, Carol is going to present a round table. So it's going to be another rich morning uh, with lots of offerings. So Jane has a question for Anna. Could Anna say a little more about encouraging depth work in nature? For example, you mentioned the yellow beetle. Anna, would you like to um, respond to that if you want to unmute yourself? You there, Anna? I can see you. The question and. Um, Sometimes sitting around the campfire, I can tell that somebody's really scared and has no spiritual literacy and possibly very little um, resources to talk about their experience. But during the day, I've heard them express their awe and wonder. And I use that example because there was one guy beside me one night who, who, who was petrified and couldn't speak at all. And I said, well, just say, I enjoyed the yellow beetle, which gave him permission to say that. And since that time, that person has delved deeper and deeper into what that meant for them and found their words and their spirituality. So that's starting where they're at. And I think that um, Peter Adam was saying that's the object for that person. The object was the yellow beetle. Does that help? <laughs> yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, someone had a question. Is Lucy Abbott Tucker's book available, Stephen, on Kindle? There's a Kindle version. Um, I just quickly looked in the Kindle Australian version. It's only coming up with paperback. Uh, will be available, not just yet. Okay, so that is on its way. Uh, yay, says Ross. <laughs> um, 
Wonderful. And so thank you to everyone who joined. Thank you for participating in the conversation and creating this community. As I mentioned, there's a Facebook page. Um, if people want to jump on there, if you're part of Facebook, um, it, it doesn't have a huge amount of posts and things, but feel free to use that if you want to connect with other uh, presenters. Thank you again to our presenters today, David, Irene and uh, Peter for their um, contribution and looking at the area of publishing. Thank you again to Noel and Anna um, uh, for your contributions and round tables. Um, yes, and thank you very much. Um, thank you, getting some nice uh, thank yous from people. And um, let's keep the conversation going and, and, you know, really encouraging each other in our own research and, and contributions. So, good day. Bye to everyone. See you later. Thank you, Kristen. I'll just add that this will all be recorded if there's something that you missed or you want to revisit it will be up on our SDI's YouTube site fairly quickly probably by tomorrow and uh, let your friends know it's all free and uh, we'd love it for, for it to be a resource to all of you thank you for being here Blessing. cool thank you thanks Stephen for your help in the background <laughs> great job Kristen oh thanks Tim <laughs>